morning, Oakwood. Glad you're here today. Anybody enjoying this rain? It's always good to get a little rain in, uh, in the middle of summer, isn't it? So or I guess the early part of summer. We're going to uh, do a little quick mini-series, only two, two uh, uh, sessions, on doctrines of the New Testament. Today we're going to look at the doctrine of baptism, and next week we're going to look at the doctrine of communion. You know, life is filled with a lot of choices every day. You don't want paper or plastic. Do you want a booth or a table? If you're flying, do you want an aisle seat or do you want a window? Potatoes or fries, you know? And and some choices really don't have much of a, a significance, but then there are some choices that we make have eternal consequences, such as heaven or hell. So today we're going to look at Doctrine of the New Testament, Part 1, and we're going to talk about baptism. Why is talking about doctrine important? You know, right now people are running from denominational churches faster than any point in time in history. Why? Because some of those churches place the traditions of man and the doctrines of man over the doctrines of Scripture. So while doctrine may not sound very exciting or interesting to you, it is absolutely essential. And the Bible tells us to guard our doctrine very closely. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. I believe we might be in that time that the Apostle Paul was talking about. People want to hear what they want to hear. He said in Titus 1.9, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Then in the next chapter, he says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. So while it may not sound very exciting to talk about doctrine, it is absolutely essential. And one of the doctrines that is often overlooked in the New Testament is the doctrine of baptism. Now, many of you, maybe most of you here today have been baptized. There are people here that maybe didn't fully understand what they did when they were baptized. There are some people that maybe were, were sprinkled or poured on or splashed on, and the, the term that was used when that happened was maybe done by a priest or that pastor who used that phrase, I'm going to baptize you, and then they sprinkled or poured on, on top of them. The mistake a lot of people make when they start talking about a topic, they will cherry pick one verse out of the Bible and they will form their whole belief and their whole faith and their whole, you know, basis of what they think the Bible's trying to say on one verse. So if you just take one verse out of the Bible on baptism and decide you're going to form your opinion on baptism by that one verse, That's really not a good way to do it. The Bible speaks a lot on baptism, and we're going to use a lot of scriptures today, okay? Now, I'm not setting the record on the number of scriptures that we're going to use today. That belongs to Dan Wilson, but I'm going to be close. Now, we're going to go kind of fast through these scriptures, and if you don't catch them, download the app. If you haven't done that, you can get all of these scriptures on the sermon notes. If you don't have a smartphone, call the church office and Olivia will email you a copy of these scriptures. Or if you don't have an email, she will make a copy and she will mail these to you. Okay, I want you to have these. So if if we go fast enough and you don't get all these scriptures, um, don't worry. We'll we'll get those in in your hands because you may not be able to write fast enough. Over the years that I've been in ministry, I've baptized a lot of people. 
And the one thing that never gets old is the excitement of new believers. I can remember one of our ladies, Judy Thorpe, when I baptized her. And it was kind of a private ceremony a Wednesday night after church. And she said, this is the best day of my life. I am so excited. I feel so clean. We shared some uh, baptism stories, Eric and I did, as we were talking this week. We, we, we need to write these down because we've had some real experiences. And, and in fact, uh, David Duke, who's here, used to help me with the baptisms over at Davis Park. We've got some stories, don't we, David? I want to show you just a couple of little short videos uh, of some little boys that were excited at their baptism, Okay. Can we cue those up now? This is supposed to have some sound, and I think these were brothers being baptized, so... I have not had that happen to me, okay? Uh, we have accepted Christ as his Savior and as his Lord, and he will demonstrate his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, by willingly being baptized this morning. He's been waiting on this day a long time. <laughs> and so, Jordan, upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the sun. Do it. And of the whole sun. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Jordan. I hope you never lose the excitement of walking with Christ and the excitement of, of baptism. Let's talk for a few moments about the importance of baptism. Jesus set the example, and he modeled baptism for us. He went into the Jordan River, and he was baptized. Now, Jesus obviously had no sin. He did not need to be baptized, but this was an important enough topic and an important enough issue that he personally set the example, and he walked into the water and was baptized. All four of the Gospels carry this account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all carry the account of Jesus' baptism. That was an important event. And we see here as we read through the Scripture in Matthew chapter 3, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, but you come to me. Jesus replied, let it, be, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. And a voice from heaven saying, this is my son who I love, with who I am well pleased. Okay, this is the only example in the Bible where we see all three persons of the Trinity. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself was God in the flesh, went into the water. We heard the voice of God, and then this, the dove came down and anointed and landed on Jesus, and so we saw the Spirit of God. The dove was representing the Spirit of God. So Jesus set the example. He's not asking us to do something that he himself did not go do. He also commanded us to do this. You know, often the last words of somebody are some of the most important words. Maybe if you've ever been around someone when they've been on their deathbed and they gather their family together and they issue kind of their last words, hey, I want you to do this, this, and this, you pay attention to those because those are important words. Jesus, before he left this earth, gave his disciples this command. 
In Matthew chapter 28, we know this as the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the end of age. And then in Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, he said, Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. These were the last commands that Jesus gave his disciples. This is what I want you to do. He could have spoke on anything else. Hey, I want you to go and heal. I want you to to share love. But he said, this is my command that I want you to do. As you read through the Bible, and especially the book of Acts, you're going to see that there are no biblical examples of people who received Christ, who made a decision to accept Christ, that were not also baptized. And we have no Bible examples of people who were baptized that did not first accept Christ into their life. And so people sometimes want to separate baptism and and, and salvation, but the Bible never does. Every single biblical example that we have, pair them together. People accept Christ and were baptized, period. And so the issue that a lot of people have with baptism is, do I have to be baptized to be saved? No, the Bible says you have to be obedient. And what did Jesus say? Be baptized. Do as I did. I went into the water to be baptized. And I'm giving the command, the last command I gave before I left this earth, does go preach and teach and baptize. We have the the history of the book of, uh, the history of the church in the book of Acts. And all the conversions in there all required baptism. And they all centered around baptism. As we look at on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to to the number that day. Can you imagine the baptisms that were going on? I mean, in my mind, I have a hard time even wrapping my mind around that. If, if people were being baptized and they were turning around and maybe baptizing others, I don't know. Maybe they were like this little boy. People walked into the water and baptized. I don't know. We're not told that. Philip in, in the eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verse 32, tells us, this is the passage of Scripture that eunuch was reading, and he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and his lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from this earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who's this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him about the good news of Jesus Christ. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. We see the example of the conversion of Saul, who we know as the Apostle Paul, in chapter 9, verse 18 says, immediately something like scales fell from Paul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. And after t- taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't this a man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Paul grew more and more powerful and baffled, and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, Paul's conversion included baptism. We see Lydia she was a, a worker, uh, dealt with purple garments in chapter 16, 
The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. We see the Philippian jailer in chapter 16, a little bit further, that his entire family here was, was baptized. Chapter, chapter 16, verse 33 says, At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God and he and his whole household. That very night, they didn't wait. They were baptized immediately. So when you look through the Bible and you see Jesus set the example, he commanded us to do it. The apostles also did it. All the conversions and all the examples of people who accepted Jesus in the Bible you will find no examples of people that accepted Christ who were not baptized. None. It's pretty important. Well, so what's the meaning of baptism? Well, I believe it's an act of submission and obedience to Jesus Christ. You know, we're unable to earn salvation on our own. And as we surrender to God, it means that we're giving in to Him. That means that we surrender. We, we give it up. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 that we just read said, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for what? The forgiveness of your sins. And then in verse 41, did we still have that verse? They're working on it. I threw him a curveball. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added that day. You're talking about a great day for the history of the church. We also see that it's a, it's a burial in the likeness of Jesus Christ. When someone dies and are buried and they're put underground, Jesus was buried and for three days he rose. On the third day, he rose. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, says that there's a great correlation to us being buried with Christ. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And then in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. You see, in baptism, we are buried under water. Now, we're not going to keep you three days like Jesus was in, in the, the tomb, okay? I don't want you to, to worry about that. But you're buried with him, and then you come out, a new person. You know, when you get dirty, you take a bath. Baptism symbolizes, too, the washing away of our sins, the remission of our sins. That's why we take a bath. And it removes the, the dirt, the grime, and the sweat from our bodies. And Christ associated with this the forgiveness of sins and the washing away with the, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. A lot of people have, this, have an issue with the washing away of the sins, okay? This is Scripture. Alan didn't write this. This is Scripture. It symbolizes washing away of your sins. Just like when you take a bath, it washes away the dirt and the grime, it also signifies a union 
with Jesus himself. You know, on, at baptism, we put on Christ, very much like a wedding ceremony. When you get married, you make a union with that other person. You say, I belong to you, you belong to me. And at baptism, we make a union with Jesus, a covenant that says, I now belong to you and you belong to me. The Scripture tells us over and over again that we're the bride of Christ and we're joined in marriage through baptism. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So we put on Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 tells us, For we were all baptized by one Spirit, So as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we are all given one spirit to drink. Baptism also symbolizes a new birth. And it's associated with the Holy Spirit. And you see, baptism for the Christian becomes a moment of new birth. Rising out of the water, we become that new person in Jesus Christ. Now, There's a lot of, I think, controversy of when does a person receive the Holy Spirit? Is it when they walk into the water, when they go down into the water, completely under, when they come back out, when they dry off? The Scripture's a little vague on that. Let me give you an example. We had five kids last week make decisions for Jesus Christ to accept Christ at church camp. Two of them were baptized at at camp. And we're going to see two of them next week be baptized here. Now, when they accepted Christ at camp, did they receive the Holy Spirit then or just the two that were baptized? What about the three that were on the bus coming home that have yet to be baptized? Well, that's a little vague. Because Scripture doesn't tell us the exact moment that you receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Scripture that we read, these Gentiles had not yet been baptized, but they had already received the Holy Spirit. Now, that's an exceptional case from the book of Acts. We have no other examples in the Bible where people had the Holy Spirit that hadn't yet accepted Christ and been baptized. So when does that happen? These five kids from our church... Two were baptized, three have not yet been baptized, but they all accepted Christ. When did they receive the Holy Spirit? I'll let you guys study on that one and then get back with me. But that new birth is associated with the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 tells us, We were therefore buried with him through baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And then John chapter 3 verse 5 tells us, Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. So we see that Jesus gave us a command and he gave us the importance of baptism. Now we see the meaning of baptism. Let's talk about the actual act of baptism itself. The scriptures stipulate immersion. This is one topic that when we have Discover Oakwood or Commitment 101 that is talked about maybe more than any other topic that we do is baptism. And what form of baptism should be should be practiced. In each case in the New Testament, okay, in every case, the command to be baptized used the word, the Greek word baptizo. That means to, to dip, to plunge all the way under. There's, the Greek language had other specific words for sprinkling or pouring, but baptizo was immersion to go all the way under, to take the plunge. We have a book that we give to kids about baptism. It's called Taking the Plunge. That means you go under, like that kid that jumped in. He took the plunge. A person receives the Holy Spirit. When? Well, 
we've got a lot of verses that say when you're baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit. There's also a few verses that tell you that you've got the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. And I know that some churches teach and preach a, a separate baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I've read through the Bible several times, and nowhere in the Bible do I read of another baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, Ephesians 4 verse 5 says there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And you see, the Holy Spirit was a promise from Jesus himself, and it was given on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 verse 38 that we just read. Romans 8 9 tells us if we do not have the Spirit of Christ, we do not belong to him. Well, it's a test of our obedience as well. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this issue of do I have to be baptized to be saved, it's not an issue of do I have to, it's an issue of obedience. Jesus said to do it, and that ought to settle it. And if we want to argue schematics of, well, do you have to be, don't argue with me. Okay? Read your Bible. That's why we've got all these scriptures that talk about baptism today. And he commanded his disciples when he left this earth in Matthew 28, verse 19, to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why he said to go do this. I came up with a kind of a list of questions that are sometimes asked about baptism. And so I want to kind of deal with those real quickly. First one is who should be baptized? In Mark 16, 16, it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So I think who should be baptized? Repentant believers should be baptized. Well, how should you be baptized? We've kind of already covered that. The only practice taught biblically is immersion. That's the only practice that was done in the New Testament, complete body immersion. Well, what about sprinkling and pouring? You know, some churches offer a choice. Do you want to be sprinkled? Do you want to be poured? Well, I can imagine on the day of Pentecost, on 3,000 people getting saved, um, that would have been quite a challenge. Some churches save up and, and do a whole bunch of baptisms all at once. And, you know, if it's a matter of convenience, you could hook up the garden hose and get a lot of people wet real quick. But that isn't what Jesus said to do. So how did this whole issue of sprinkling come about? I researched that. In 753, it was allowed by the Catholic Church, okay? The Catholic Church got involved, and they allowed sprinkling only in the case of an emergency, okay? Only in the case of an emergency. Then uh, the, the Catholic Church again got involved, and they held a council in Ravenna, Italy in 1311, and that decision was made to allow a candidate to choose between immersion or sprinkling. But then there was an assembly later, Assembly of the Divines, an angelical church meeting in the Westminster Cathedral in London in 1643. The subject of sprinkling or baptism came up, and they held a vote. 24 voted for baptism, 24 voted for sprinkling. So the chairman of that council, Dr. Lightfoot, had to cast the deciding vote, and he voted for sprinkling. So it's been an issue for, for some time. So it appears the choice was a result of convenience more than a scriptural teaching. Well, what about children in baptism? Some denominations practice infant baptism or christening or sprinkling. Jesus made it clear that children were already in the kingdom of God. And in fact, he said in Matthew 18, 3 and 4, unless you become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he said in chapter 19, let the little children come to me. So children already belong to Jesus. 
So when does a child need to accept Christ and be baptized? You know, I don't know that there's a magical age. I believe when a child understands that they are a sinner, that they have sin in their life and that they need a Savior and they understand the only way that those sins can be forgiven is through the blood of Jesus Christ, that's when they now realize, I need a Savior. So it's not an easy answer. I think it varies from child to child. Scripture doesn't give us that exact time. Who can baptize someone? Well, interestingly, Scripture doesn't focus a lot on the person who does the baptism, but more the person who is baptized. John chapter 4 verse 2 said, although in fact he, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So apparently Jesus didn't do a lot of baptisms. Paul, I don't think, personally did a lot of baptisms either. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14 said, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. Yes, I baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. See, it appears that Paul allowed other believers to do the baptisms. Well, what about baptisms as a requirement for church membership. There's a lot of churches that if you go to join their church, you now have to go through baptism again. At Oakwood, baptism is a requirement for membership, not because we want you to be baptized in Oakwood Christian Church, okay? Far more important than you being rebaptized so you can join Oakwood Christian Church is that you become a part of the body of Christ first. That's why we require baptism, so that you yourself are a part of the body of Christ. If a person wants to show that they're surrendering their life to Christ, that's a personal decision. We don't require someone who was baptized years ago to go through that process again. You're already a part of the body of Christ. What about this issue? Does a person need to be baptized more than once, or can they be baptized more than once? I personally believe it's okay. We don't have any biblical examples of people who were baptized multiple times, but I don't believe it's wrong. Is it necessary? No. But is it wrong? No. Unless you were baptized for the wrong reason, you know, my, my girlfriend wanted me to be baptized. Okay, I'll be baptized. Won't date you unless you do. Probably not the right reason. Or maybe you didn't fully understand it. You were unaware of what you're doing. Is it necessary for Christians to be rebaptized? No. But is it okay? Yeah. One of the most important one of the most important doctrines of the New Testament, I believe, is baptism. We've covered a lot of scripture really fast. I wanted you to understand what the Bible says about baptism. Not what you've been taught, not what you have thought somebody else said, or maybe even some church may have sometime presented this as, hey, this is the doctrine and tradition of, of our church. We try to do things biblically, God's way. And he set the example for us to do that. So I want to encourage you to when you approach this subject of baptism, do it God's way. Not man's way, do it God's way. And when you read through the scriptures, I think it will just take care of any confusion of, do I have to be baptized to be saved? Jesus says, you need to be obedient. Pray with me. Father, as we've looked at this subject of baptism today, it's something that uh, weighs on the heart of many, many people. In fact, you yourself realized that this was important and showed us how, the, showed us the example Lord Jesus, I just pray that if there's someone here today that hasn't named you as Lord and Savior, that they decide to do that today. 
Maybe there's someone here that has been challenged that maybe the form that they were, the method they were baptized in wasn't a biblical method. Maybe there's someone here deciding and wrestling with this. Do I have to be baptized to be saved? Do I, I just pray that they just open their heart to your word, to your teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an important decision. All the, you know, paper or plastic, potato or fries, those things don't have eternal consequences. Heaven and hell do. Maybe you've decided today that I want my eternal destination to be heaven. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus. Maybe you have never been baptized, but maybe today you've been challenged that I need to be obedient to Jesus. After our service... There'll be some of our staff, some of our elders. We want to introduce you to Jesus and allow you that opportunity for baptism. One of the things uh, I almost forgot, we get to do each and every Lord's Day is take the Lord's Supper. We'll deal with that next week. But it's a time in our, in our life where first Jesus asked to identify with him. Now we're asked to remember him, to remember what he did for us on the cross. I'm going to have a whole lot about communion next week and the importance of it and how we should take it, why we should take it. But today, this is our chance to take that little loaf and cup. And if you are watching at home, I hope you made preparations to do this. And if you didn't get one this morning, just hold up your hand as you walked in. Just hold up your hand and one of our ushers will get you a a little communion kit. But this is an opportunity to spend those precious moments with Jesus to remember his sacrifice. Lord, as we give to you this time... Father, as we commune with you, may we acknowledge the sacrifice you made for us. How important this is to recognize your body and blood. In Jesus' name, amen.